Hello. Good afternoon, one and all. I'm Dr. Cindy here, and my topic today is um, keeping a child safe um, using vaccines, myocarditis, prevention, and mental well-being. Okay. So. Um, Keeping your child safe begins with keeping your child healthy. In 1948, WHO uh, made a statement to say that the state of complete physical, mental and social well-being is a state of health and not just merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Well, a healthy child actually has um, in infections, uh, quite a few infections every year. In the first one to two years of starting school, the child will have eight to ten infections per year. And in the subsequent one to two years, another six to eight infections. And then in the last uh, two years, they would have about four to six infections per year. And then that uh, roughly that throughout their whole life. The common infections include the common cold, bronchitis or bronchiolitis, gastroenteritis, which is mainly viral, childhood exanthem, such as hand foot mouth disease and exanthem subitum and also some bacterial infections commonly bacterial pharyngitis and acute otitis media. Now um, there are three definitions of health we can think about to of today. One of them is the absence of disease. The second one allows the individual to cope with all the demands of daily life, also implying the absence of disease or impairment. And lastly, is to maintain a state of equilibrium that an individual has established within himself, his social and physical environment. And so when we try to promote health, we can look at this um, uh, in terms of uh, dif um, the different definitions. So if we are looking at the absence of disease for for instance, at the start of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we tried to eliminate the virus. Now, and then um, we found that it was a little bit difficult to cope. So the government actually had started to roll out uh, financial aid to the population, and that actually enhances the person's ability to cope with the uh, with his environment and also to lead a healthy life. And lastly, now that we are uh, entering the endemic state, we are now trying to maintain a state of equilibrium. So we want to actually uh, take preventative actions such as giving vaccines, seeking early treatments such as antiviral treatments, and that would be in harmony with the individual and his or her community's values. And uh, do remember that the values of each individual is actually shaped through life under the influence of the parents, the friends, schools, media, law, and one's own life experience and cause. Now, uh, vaccination is no stranger to um, the child, as the child has to undergo many immunizations during their um, early childhood. And we have successfully um, been able to contain quite a few of these childhood infections. But um, the common cold is the one that has been uh, quite uh, elusive. And so the rhinovirus uh, uh, actually consists of 30 to 50 uh, percent of the uh, of the common cold infections, and there are 100 different serotypes of rhinoviruses. The coronavirus actually makes up about 10 to 15 percent of the common cold, and up to uh, up to today, there's no vaccine available for both the rhinovirus as well as the coronavirus. The coronavirus is a little bit tricky because it hops from humans to animals and vice versa. But um, when this uh, global uh, pandemic was declared by WHO on the 11th of March, the vaccines were then developed to combat this pandemic. And to expedite the process, there were many combined phase two and three trials. Finally, on the 2nd of December 2020, um, UK was the first country to roll out the uh, vaccines under the emergency use authorization. This was followed quite quickly uh, by Canada and uh, US. But what happens is that we do have to remember that at that point in time, the vaccines were not approved, but they were granted EUA because of a public health emergency declaration to support its use during the pandemic. And as October 29th, US FDA had granted EUA for children 5 to 11 years of age. Uh, Vaccines, we have to remember that vaccines must be given with informed consent. And in June 2021, uh, one of the articles published actually advised healthcare professionals providing vaccinations throughout uh, uh, to thoroughly communicate and educate vaccination recipients on the information present on the fact sheet provided by the CDC. Recipients should also be informed on the V-Safe information sheet so that they can actually inform uh, the, um, they can inform about their adverse events through these portals. Now, the providers should also register any unusual or severe adverse effects to the vaccine adverse 
event reporting system. And the vaccine provider at that point in time in June 2021 were advised to inform pregnant women of the lack of sufficient data on the use during pregnancy. Now, um, this is of um, importance to us in terms of the informed consent because um, the government, MOH, is going to roll out vaccination for ages 5 to 11 as we speak. So um, I just received an SMS to say that uh, we have to look out in our emails uh, and there's a circular going to be sent to us regarding this vaccination. Now the 12 to 18 year olds have already been vaccinated with the adult formulation. The dose would be a 0.3 ml equivalent to 30 micrograms of the mRNA and that is equivalent to the adult dose. Now um, in patients 5 to 11 years of age, this dose has been modified and there's a new formulation being used and this comes in an orange vial 0.2 ml but this contains 10 micrograms of the mRNA vaccine. So looking at the fact sheet that um, the Pfizer vaccine has rolled out, uh, it, has say, it says that the vaccine is indicated for active immunization to prevent coronavirus disease in individuals aged 5 years and older. And uh, for the indications in pediatrics, the, um, the um, Monograph has stated that the safety and efficacy of this vaccine under five years of age has not yet been established. Also, there is a serious warning and precaution statement which says that at the time of this authorization, which was published on the 19th of November 2021, there are no known serious warnings or precautions associated with this product. Now, um, this product is relatively new, the mRNA vaccine, and these are the constituents of the vaccine. Now, the first four products actually uh, form a lipid nanoparticle which envelopes the mRNA vaccine, and the rest of them are actually stabilizers for the vaccine uh, for solution in the vaccine for administration. Now, the adverse events uh, that have been reported in the monograph states that in ages 12 years and above, especially in 12 to 15 year olds, 226 adolescents were included in this um, analysis and they found that 90.5% had injection site pain, 77.5% experienced fatigue, headaches in 75.5% and chills in 49%. And the other two um, commonly experienced uh, uh, adverse effects were muscle pain and also joint pain. In the 5 to 11 year olds, the data cutoff date was on the 8th of October and there was a follow-up period of at least three months. 1,456 children received this vaccine and there was injection site pain in 84.3% and fatigue in close to 52%, headache in 38% and joint pain in 7.6%. In the post-market uh, analysis, they found that there were other adverse reactions that they were not expecting and one of them was myocarditis. And um, it is reported that because these above reactions were reported voluntarily from a population of uncertain size, it is not always possibly to reliably estimate their frequency or establish a causal relationship to product exposure. They were included in the monograph because they represent reactions that are known to occur following immunizations generally or are potentially serious or on the basis of their frequency of reporting. Uh, the long-term effects of this vaccine are not known and uh, currently the vaccines are deemed to be safe but we have to understand that safety means no obvious clinical manifestation that causes harm in the short term. By definition, no long-term data is available. In um, looking at children, we have to think ahead because if we give a child a vaccination at the age of 5 to 10 years old and their life expectancy is about 75 to 85 years of age, they would live for another 50 to 60 years not knowing what adverse events may occur. And given that the lipid nanoparticle technology and the mRNA technology are both relatively new, when analysing data, one also needs to be very careful to understand that when a product has not been shown to cause a certain adverse effect, it is not equivalent to saying that the, uh, the product has been shown not to cause a certain adverse event. So these two have to be taken into consideration.
Now, um, we have to review uh, mRNA COVID vaccine and myocarditis because this tends to happen in the young. Uh, for, for males aged 12 to 29 years old, this occurs in about 40.6 cases per, per million second dose. And males 12 to 17 years of age, 62.8 per million dose. And in males 18 to 24, 50.5 per million dose in contrast to males who are more than 30 years of age with an incidence of 24, uh, per, uh, 2.4 per million second dose. Now, um, I'm just going to skip through this a few of these slides uh, to just show you the um, to just to uh, in the interest of time. Okay, so it, if you give the vaccine uh, to the 12 to 29 year olds and per million doses, you would expect to prevent 11,000 cases. 560 hospitalizations, 138 ICU admissions, 6 deaths. But you expect an incidence of myocarditis from this vaccine of 39 to 47 cases. And if you look at this data, if you look at the second and the third columns, you would need to give, you would actually be preventing two deaths, but you would expect 56 to 69 myocarditis cases in patients aged 12 to 17 years of age. And that is actually quite a big number. And um, so, what about myocarditis in COVID-19? Uh, adult patients, as Edgar has alluded to, usually have some severe disease with a certain degree of cardiovascular involvement, including myocarditis. But in children, this disease tends to be pretty mild. And the one that is more associated with cardiac manifestations is multi-systemic inflammatory syndrome in children. But this tends to occur in the school growing age. Please take note that this is of great concern because 90% of these cases require ICU admission, 80% require inotropic support, and 28% require ECMO support. And it is important to recognize them because all cases should be hospitalized for further management. And this, this manifestation is very similar to um, Kawasaki disease, but with the difference that these tend to occur in older children and there are also gastrointestinal symptoms rather than just mucositis. Um, if you're brave enough to keep the patient for a while longer, you may proceed with some basic tests like cardiac enzymes, blood tests, and ECG and echocardiogram. My, per my personal uh, take on this is if you see a case like this, just refer. All right. So to prevent infections in general, we have to keep our child healthy with good hygiene. Do not forget good nutrition, adequate hydration, adequate exercise and physical activity and adequate sleep. Now, what happens is that uh, we have to remember also that when we introduce vaccines, we are targeting mainly the adaptive immunity. The innate immunity is less differentiated and we can actually work on it. And there are some of the normal uh, traditional methods that may help with the innate immunity. Um, Authors uh, as early as 20, uh, seven, uh, 2017 have published that because vaccines are difficult to develop for the common cold, um, consideration should be given to complementary alternative medicine and dietary supplements. Now, dietary supplements are not all hocus pocus, and they actually have done extensive research on dietary supplements. So, just to um, show you for vitamin C, Okay, they have actually done uh, uh, research to show that they are, it's beneficial to cellular function. It helps neutrophil chemotaxis, phagocytosis, and lymphocyte function. It's also an, a potent antioxidant, and then it's also a free radical scavenger that helps to reduce oxidative st uh, stress in the lungs. And um, also, it actually helps to protect the host tissue from excessive damage. And this is rolled out in um, studies which show that the recovery from pneumonia in the elderly uh, actually is improved with vitamin C supplementation, whether it be a low dose or a higher dose at 50, 500 to 1,600 milligrams per day. Uh, vitamin D also has multiple studies done and also um, do take note that a lot of these popular um, extracts that, uh, that um, a lot of parents give their, uh, their, their children, such as elderberry extract, they do actually have um, uh, some properties and honey also uh, has got antioxidant um, properties and it also stimulates phagocytosis and improves T and B cell function. Now, the mental well-being of uh, infants and toddlers and children are also affected in different ways. Um, to just say the least, infants actually start to 
uh, have a new normal where they stay indoors, they have fewer social interactions and um, toddlers also then sometimes develop speech delay. And in children and adolescents, uh, the parents and the teachers do need to learn how to pick up uh, some changes that the kids may undergo and to seek help early. So with this, um, I thank you.